Nutrition 2021 and beyond. I know this is something that we all wrestle with is having healthy nutrition, particularly these days, particularly in the United States, where it's easy to be bad. And over 30 years of clinical practice, this is the one area that I'm working on with myself and with my patients all the time, every day. It's an everyday thing. Processed food companies love the fact that it's easy to be bad and difficult to be good. That's why on the Super Bowl, you'll see ads for soda and snack foods. You won't see, you won't see ads for broccoli and Brussels sprouts, right? Because broccoli and Brussels sprouts, we're not addicted to that. Processed foods have been chemically altered and changed to actually make them addictive. And they taste really good and you can't say no and boy does it make us fat and sick, right? And it causes all kinds of diseases. So when I have patients coming in to see me, and we need to know that most of what I'm about to tell you is preventable. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, dementia, strokes, and so forth. Even chronic pain and arthritis. These things are preventable, and the number one thing that we need to wor work on is the fuel that we're putting in our mouth. So I wanted to introduce this show to you as 2021 and beyond. Even though it's October of 2020 right now, get started now. Don't wait for, oh, it's almost Halloween. I'm sure in a modified sense with uh, our, our wonderful new friend COVID. So I'm going to wait after that. And then Thanksgiving's coming up. And then we have the holidays after that and the, the, uh, the religious holidays. And then we have New Year's Eve. I mean, I, I'm going to wait until the new year. No, no, no. Get started now. Because if there's only three or four holidays between now and the end of the year, that's only three or four cheat days, if you will. So the time is now to get started. You have the added extra incentive, here we are in 2020 in the history of humankind, of coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2. It has been well demonstrated that if you have a comorbidity, which means if you have a chronic disease already, you have a much higher risk of having a more severe disease if you get exposed to coronavirus, just like you did with seasonal flu. Now seasonal flu for decades and so forth, has impacted more people that were elderly with chronic diseases. Well, if you look at the numbers around the world, the same exact thing has happened with coronavirus. So as I get into this nutrition program here, our extra incentive is I want to fortify my immune system. Very likely that we're all going to get exposed. It's very likely that we've all been, many, many more of us have already been exposed than the numbers show. But as we know, a lot of us don't express any symptoms whatsoever. So that's our extra incentive. Starting off, I want to remind you, if you're not already aware of this study that came out of Harvard in 2020, they are stating that you can add 10 years of health span, not 10 years of life, not 10 years of existence, but 10 years of a disease-free life by doing five things and doing these five things regularly. Eat clean, maintain your weight, exercise for 30 minutes a day, and then avoid two bad things. Don't smoke and limit, limit alcohol. Just those five things. Just those five things. Look, look at the first three. Clean eating and maintaining weight and getting regular exercise. Well, that's actually two things because maintaining weight, how do you do that? Clean eating and exercise. And now we're down to two. We're, do, we're down to two things. Basically, if you do two things, and, and people I think already know, don't smoke and limit your alcohol. We're now down to two things. Eat clean. Eat the cleanest diet you possibly can. And get 30 minutes of exercise every day to your tolerance. Okay? So that's what Harvard in 2020, you can just go to Google and put in Harvard 2020 10 years health span. The article will pop right up. Fabulous type uh, thing going on here. As I get into my recommendations, just keep in mind, this is my disclaimer. Do not make any changes to your nutrition or your exercise or anything else without consulting with your doctor, particularly if you have a chronic disease or disorder, as I had mentioned earlier, and particularly if you're taking any medications whatsoever. Please talk to your doctor first and let your doctor know, this is what I want to do. Please watch me carefully, watch me frequently, even if it's telemedicine right now. Watch me carefully and as I go through this and you are on the medications, maybe that will change. Maybe you'll need less, maybe. But check with your doctor. Okay, making changes stick. If you want to, go to my website, drscottfolder.com. Go to my website and you can look at my nutrition outline that has more details, but I'm going to hit on some high points here. 
only water, don't drink any calories. This one point, if you get this and do this, for a lot of you, problem solved. Only drink water, so that's no soda, no diet soda, no sport drinks, nothing at all. Do not buy any drinks in, in the store that taste good. A patient of mine came in last week and said, here is a kombucha drink. And is it okay? I asked them, does it taste good? They said, yes. I said, no. And they bought the container in, and sure enough, I, did, I, I asked them, did you read the ingredients? No. Let's read the ingredients together. And it was water, and the third ingredient was sugar. And then there was sugar buried in the ingredients list even later on as well, okay? That's why I said, remember if it tastes good, or as Jack Willane said, if it tastes good, spit it out. No snacks after dinner is the next one. No snacks after dinner. For some of you, if you make just that one change, that can be a huge life-changing event for you. We want to be careful of packing ourselves full of fuel and then going to bed, right? Filling up the gas tank and going to bed. What's going to happen overnight? That's right. It's all changed to fat. No snacking after dinner. Rethinking breakfast. This is something, again, mostly in the United States, we only do this here where we have sugary breakfasts. Muffins and bagels and pancakes and whatever else that we're having with syrup and jellies and all this kind of stuff, right? You look around the world, most of the, most of the places are not doing this. So rethink your breakfast. If you're going gluten-free but you're still having grains, maybe it's quinoa or amaranth or gluten-free oats and you make that with walnuts and blueberries, cheap tastes good, fast, kids will probably like it. For your kids, instead of giving them cereal that changes the color of milk, right? We know that that's a bad thing to do. So rethink their breakfast. Maybe it's just simply leftovers that they heat up and, and uh, that, that they like. Maybe it's a scrambled egg with some vegetables. Again, thinking of any time that you're creating a meal for your children, how can I make that a vegetable delivery system? For some of you, you need to be dairy-free. For some of you, you need to be dairy-free and gluten-free. There are reasons why these are all the rages right now. Dairy-free, I've been talking about this for, for 31 years in my practice. Dairy-free has just helped so many people with arthritis problems, autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis and gout and uh, Crohn's and colitis and gastrointestinal problems and GERD and heartburn and acid reflux and, and skin problems and asthma and eczema and so on and so forth and ear infections in children. Going dairy-free might be one thing that you will choose to do if you fall into any of the categories I just mentioned. Gluten-free can help people's gut and autoimmune diseases and struggling with thyroid problems and uh, difficulty losing weight and brain fog and, and so on and so forth. So that might be something for you to look at. Maybe you just take one of these things that I'm talking about today and just work with that and go with it. More on our list here. 10% less volume, so for some people they just need to eat a little bit less volume of food, particularly dinner. 10% less volume. One way to achieve that is eat slower. It takes time from the, for the full feeling in the stomach to neurologically activate the lept leptin that goes back to your brain that tells you I'm full. That can be 20 to 30 minutes. If you're eating quickly, you're going to eat more food. If you eat a little bit slower, less food. 10% plus more vegetables, increasing more vegetables. There's no diet anywhere. Of the thousands of diets that come out every year and the tens of thousands of diets, all of them say eat as many vegetables as you want. And just as a side note, what are the best vegetables? Here are the best. Any green, any green whatsoever. Uh, spinach, lettuce, kale, chard, any green leafy vegetable. And the other one is cruciferous vegetables. Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, bok choy, cabbage, cauliflower, kale. Those are the cruciferous vegetables. Those are the best of the best. Any vegetable is fine, more on that in a minute. And those are the best of the best. So get your vegetables going up even at breakfast, even at breakfast. 10% or less meat. Most of us, I think, realize a high meat diet is not something that's good for you long term. Most of you will agree with that. And if you think environmentally of the impact of your dietary choices on, on the planet, having 7.5 billion people and climbing fast, if you look at crops and you look at the environmental impact of growing crops, feeding crops to livestock and then eating livestock, very inefficient, huge waste of pesticides, water, antibiotics, runoff, methane, and so on and so forth, okay? 
higher plant-based diet is extremely important for the environment. We are burning down the Amazon rainforest partially to create croplands and partially because we want to create croplands to feed crops to livestock so they can make money. And that's bad. So we want to make sure that we're not cutting down the lungs of the earth. More vegetables, less meat. 10% smaller dinner and a larger lunch. Most of the countries around the world, their biggest meal is lunch. In the United States and some other countries, it's dinner. Flip-flop that and you're going to do much better. And think of your plate. The plate, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, being two-thirds vegetables, one-third meat, instead of the reverse of that, right? T-bone, vegetables, chicken, vegetables, turkey, vegetables. I grew up this way too. Ham, vegetables, roast beef, vegetables. Flip-flop that. Now it's vegetables and meat, meat being the condiment. Or if you're a vegan vegetarian, vegetables starch, right? Or uh, veg vegan vegetarians can be a lot more starch in vegetables as well. For kids, it's just so important, right? A lot of people notice this. A lot of parents notice this. If you cut up vegetables and you have a dip there that kids like, guess what? They're going to eat it, right? Notice I'm also saying vegetables. I didn't say fruit yet. So cut up vegetables and dips for kids. Salsa, guacamole, hummus, bean dips. You can make most of these at home, super cheap. That's the way to do it because you know what's, what's in there. And remember, if something really has a lot of pop to it, like if you eat something and say, wow, that tastes really good, be suspicious. Go to this website, truthinlabeling.org, truthinlabeling.org, and you're going to find hidden sources of MSG. Hidden sources of MSG, certainly the, the words natural flavors, which is in everything, can, not necessarily always, but often has MSG in it. So look into that. It's really bad for your brain. It's bad for your health. It's bad for your kid's brain. For kids, again, no soda, no fruit juice. By the way, back to d d uh, drinking, no drinking calories. That includes fruit juice. I recommend no juice for people. It's straight sugar. If you eat an orange, that's okay. But drinking orange juice from five oranges, that's bad. That's, that, that's not a good thing. And I think most people agree with that. Sport drinks, again, no for the kids. Now, cut up fruit is okay for the kids. Go heavy on the vegetables, less on the fruit. Three books I want to talk about here as well. Uh, let's start with this one. Own Yourself by Kelly Brogan. You'll see this uh, on our documents and so forth. Own Yourself. Own Yourself. Kelly Brogan. She is a holistic psychiatrist. For the past 10 years now, she was a traditional psychiatrist and she prescribed medications like most psychiatrists. Now she's a holistic psychiatrist. 10 years ago, she hung up her prescription pad. And now she specializes her office in getting people off of psychiatric medications. But she doesn't just take them off. No, no, no. She doesn't do that. And hoping that, I, I hope this is okay. She has a, an entire program of improving brain function with nutrition, with exercise, with mindfulness and meditation, with sleep, and so on and so on. Okay, Great book. I wanted to read to you the... Um, the subheading here, The Surprising Path Beyond Depression, Anxiety, and Fatigue to Reclaiming Your Authenticity, Vitality, and Freedom. And you best bet there's a lot of nutrition in that book. Here's the next one, The Hacking of the American Mind. The Hacking of the American Mind by Dr. Robert Lustig. This one talks about what I touched on earlier, that industry knows that if they chemically alter foods and they add stuff in, they can make it addictive. I'll give you an example. Let's say you really like chips. Eat one chip, put the bag away until tomorrow. Not going to happen. Eat one piece of broccoli, put the bowl away till tomorrow. No problem, I can do that. You see? They've made that one addictive and this one is not addictive. This book is all about why. The Hacking of the American Mind. Awesome read. Um, explores how industry has manipulated our most deep-seated survival instincts, in instincts are reviewed by Dr. David Perlmutter more on him later on. And the book is not just about food, it's about media and it's about lighted screens and so on and so forth. Next is The End of Alzheimer's by Dr. Dale Bredesen. I've mentioned this book on my show before, it's on my YouTube pages, on my uh, website and so on and so forth. The subheading is the first program to prevent and reverse cognitive decline. Yes, prevent and reverse things like Alzheimer's dementia. Pretty neat. Now I've mentioned this program to dozens and dozens of my patient families. Only one has taken us up on it. 
because it requires some effort. There's some nutrition changes and some exercise changes and some sleep changes and you got to give up your, your bad habits and you have to do some meditation and mindfulness work, go to the chiropractor, take care of your spine, posture, nervous system. You have to do all of these things. Some people say, it's too hard, we're just going to let people decline, which I found fascinating, but I understand why from the things that we're talking about right now. Great books, don't miss those. Do what Jack LaLanne did. If you don't know who Jack LaLanne is, please look him up. He lived until he was 96 years old. He passed away in 2011. For those of you that know, he had no chronic disease, no pharmaceutical medications, no over-the-counter medications. He exercised uh, virtually every day of his life. Even in his 90s, he was still swimming and lifting weights every day. But he also had a super clean diet, as many of you may know. And he also was a chiropractor. Although he didn't practice chiropractic, he also took care of his spine. That's why, if you ever saw him in commercials, in his 90s, he still had a tall, strong, upright posture. Pretty cool. So consider fuel. As we get into this a little bit deeper, uh, I'm going to give you some, some reasons and references of changing your nutrition, and then I'm going to review at the end my, my recommendations. Consider fuel like octane for your car, right? You wouldn't put 50 octane gasoline in your car and expect it to run great forever. No, eventually it's going to have trouble. So you, would, you wouldn't do that. People say, no, I'm not going to put 50 octane gas in my car. I'm going to put an 87 or better because I want that car running great. I don't care about your car. I care about you and your body and your, and your children and so forth. Put 87 octane or 100 octane fuel in your body, not something cheaper, and expect it to run well throughout your life. Unfortunately, we take care of, better care of our houses and our cars sometimes than our bodies, we should take the philosophy of house care and car care and teeth care and apply it to our bodies. If you let the house go, you know how much trouble it is to try to turn that back around. Same thing with your car, same thing with your teeth. Well, the same thing certainly with your body as well. What do you want for your children? If you have children, what do you want for your children? You just simply want your children to be the best version of themselves. So you want to feed them 100 octane fuel as best you can, as best you can. You want to guide them in that right direction so when they are on their own they'll make better nutrition decisions, better wellness decisions for their bodies and spine and, and nutrition and so forth down the road. And keep in mind that our CDC has said that 75% of what we spend our healthcare dollars on are for things that we can prevent. Now let's just take a, let's take a rough number. Let's say all of us heated my show here today and we all work together and we change our nutrition and our exercise habits and our sleep habits and our spine habits and so forth and we reduce chronic disease in the United States by 25%, not by the 75%, but just by 25%, right? We just completely and totally funded healthcare for the entire existence of the United States. It would pay for itself forever by just a 25% switch. Because you think about the trillions of dollars that we spend now, knocking that down by 500 billion or a trillion, you know, 25%, Problem solved. The problem would be solved. Imagine if we did better than 25%. So let me talk to you a little pathway of what developed my readings over 30 years to bring us to this point of what's the best diet, right? Well, what is the best diet? I've already mentioned some of the qualifications for that. It's going to be slightly different for, for some people. Do you need to be a vegan over here on this end or the Atkins diet, heavy meat over on this end, or the Mediterranean diet, let's say somewhere in the middle. Well, working with that, people are going to be a little bit, uh, a little varying in that. And I think bringing an end to the diet wars is a good idea. But we can pull criteria from, from these different diets here and come up with a plan that's sustainable for you. And isn't that the key, right? And that's why there's so many diet books written all the time. Um, I haven't written mine yet. I should because it'll be a bestseller and and I've got to make sure though it's only 30 days or something like that, right? Not permanent. So what we need to do is, is make those shifts, as I said earlier, and take the qualities out of here. Now, some of you will be a, ve a vegan or a vegetarian vegan, or some of you might fall into a Mediterranean diet. Now, I'm going to swing you in this direction here, taking something from Michael Pollan, where he says, eat, eat food, not too much food, by the way, not processed food. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I agree with that simple philosophy. We need to move towards plant. Everybody agrees that that's very nutritious for us and, and very good at uh, fighting chronic disease and preventing problems and so forth. But as I touched on earlier, it's also important for our environment to, to make sure that we preserve crops and food for, for all the people on the planet. 
So I remember reading the first nutrition book, Fit for Life, by Harvey Marilyn Diamond back in 1989, 1990. Then I, so that's when I knocked out dairy products. And then I read Diet for New America by John Robbins, and that talked about the environmental impact of crops and so forth. I touched on that earlier. Then I moved on to Dr. John McDougall. McDougall's Medicine, 10 Days to Dynamic Health, M McDougall Plan, uh, the McDougal Plan, pro a program for women, and you know, read all the all of his book, not all of his books, but many of his books, as you can tell. And he's been teaching nutrition for disease prevention and chronic disease treatment for 45 years. Dr. John McDougal, he's still at it. He's cut some great videos in 2020. I suggest doing that. Now, his his nutrition plan is vegan, so he recommends a vegan diet. And don't shut that off if you think that that's uh, a, a, a too much for you to do. Just just take a look at it. But let's pull some of the stuff from, from all of those things that I just mentioned. Then I read Eating Well for Optimum Health by Dr. Andrew Weil. I think that it came out in the year 2000, so 20 years ago. The book, The Meat You Eat by Ken Midkiff, I think that was 2005. If you read that book, you will never buy conventionally raised meat. And when I say meat, I mean red meat, chicken, poultry, turkey, pork. I mean all, all meat. You will never buy it in a store again unless it's cage-free, organic, no antibiotics, no pesticides, no GMO, no, no um, um, uh, glyphosate, and, and so forth. You will, you will never do that if you read that book. Really interesting read. I, th I think you should. Food Rules by Michael Pollan. I touched on that. Great little book. Easy read. Blue Zones by Dan Buettner. This is a great book. Blue Zones. Blue Zones. It's the groups of people around the world that have a high percentage of those that live to 100. So there's pockets of these people around the world. Okinawa, Sicily, another Mediterranean island that I can't remember. Costa Rica, Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Lima, California. And there's a couple of other blue zones around the world. Now, if you hear that, that's around the world, right? There are characteristics that are similar in these people, though. Guess what? High plant-based diet, if they have any meat at all, some of them have no meat. If they have any meat at all, it's a condiment. Their biggest meal is lunch. They get their foods local. Their starches differ. In Okinawa, it's sweet potatoes. In Costa Rica, it's corn. In Sicily, it's wheat. So they're eating these starches. They have starch-based diets, high in vegetables, a little bit of meat, and so forth. Kind of makes sense. A very Mediterranean diet, if you will. Great book, great read. Then I moved on. I read some, well, this is an older one. I just put this in here. Sugar Blues. Sugar Blues. It was written by William Duffy. But that was in 1975, 45 years ago. He was writing a book of, be careful of added sugar. Where are we now, right? Way worse. <laughs> so interesting, interesting book and read. The Paleo Diet by Lauren Cordain. I read that. Uh, also, The Paleo Diet for Athletes. Read that by also Lauren Cordain. Great information to extract from that. Now, of course, that leans more toward meat. And um, in a mo I'm going to just uh, fast forward to uh, Mark Hyman who coined the word pegan diet. Paleo, which I just mentioned, and vegan, pegan. So it's a high vegetable paleo diet. So I always suggest if somebody's gonna do a paleo diet, make it a high vegetable paleo diet, okay? So then we can include all the paleo people in here, but I just say, you have to swing more toward vegetables because it's better for your health and it's better for the environment and we're gonna preserve enough food for everybody and and uh, it's going to reduce fossil fuel consumption, and it's probably better for reducing chronic disease anyway. The Brain-Body Diet by Sarah Gottfried. Uh, I haven't read the full book yet, but it looks fantastic. She's discussing regaining and stabilizing mental health and preventing burnout, depression, and anxiety in her book. Um, lots of vegetables, of course, in there as well. Um, three books, Fat Chance by Robert Lustig, who read, wrote the other book that I mentioned earlier, Grain Brain by Dr. David Perlmutter, Wheat Belly by Dr. William Davis. Three great books that talk about straightening out your diet and preserving your gut and your brain. Eat Fat, Get Thin by Mark Hyman that I mentioned earlier. Great book, uh, excellent resource. Brain Maker, Dr. David Perlmutter did Grain Brain, but then he did Brain, brain Maker. Wow, what an awesome book. Brain Maker, now he is a medical neurologist. You would expect that Brain Maker would be all about brain stuff, right? He actually talks a lot about the gut and the microbiome. And this is a huge research endeavor and by a lot of people right now. As a matter of fact, I know one company that's working on 
um, a, a gut protocol for, um, for uh, autism. And so that's a very hot topic in research. Okay? The hacking of the American mind, I mentioned the end of Alzheimer's. Terry Walls, go to terrywalls.com. Terry Walls talks about reversing multiple sclerosis with diet. Great stuff, great TED Talks. Uh, timed eating, you've heard about intermittent fasting. This works very well for certain people. Uh, in the book, uh, The End of Alzheimer's by, by Dr. Dale Predison, he talks about this as well. Try to have 12 hours between the last time you eat at night and when you eat in the morning. Try to make that, uh, the, longer, the longer the better because you're going to shift towards burning sugar to burning fat and that's very good for your brain. So you looked into that. I've got some patients that, uh, that are doing that now. They're, they're bringing in the limiters of when they're consuming food. I have one, person, one patient right now that only eats from noon to six. It took him some time to get there, but he says, you know, I get up now and I'm, just, I'm not hungry. And he is a, he's a young guy, he's like in his early 40s, and he's fit and he works out regularly and he's built muscle, he's dropped weight through the years, he feels fantastic, chronic problems and pains have gone away. And he says, yeah, it's easy. He says it's easy now to do that. So time to eating, you don't necessarily have to do it 12 to six. Don't let that uh, disturb you, but something to look at. I have a video uh, called Water Rules. If you're watching this on cable, so go to my YouTube page, uh, Dr. Sc just go to YouTube, Dr. Scott Fuller. You can put in uh, Dr. Scott Fuller Water Rules, and that'll get you there. And watch my, watch my video on water, wa water. How to get enough water in, have a strategy. I have to have a strategy. If I don't have that strategy, I fall off. I would say 80% of my patients that come into my office are chronically dehydrated. We could fix lots of stuff by doing that. Have 12 ounces of water in the morning before you have anything else. Eliminate plastic. I'm having I'm in discussions with a lot of my patients right now about this. Get a water filter. Get a water filter. I have patients that go to the grocery store. They're busting themselves up, lifting cases of water, putting it on the bottom of their carriage, going out to the car, bending over, lugging it out of there, into their car, from the car, into the house, and they're just wrecking their backs. And literally, they're coming in with flares up of back pain. So there's two things. Number one, it's going to preserve your back. Uh, three things. Number two, it's going to save you a heck of a lot of, a lot of money. Sure, you might get a good water filter, which is a little bit more money on the, uh, up front, but it will save you tons of dough down the road. And number three, the plastic. You don't want the plastic leaching into your water. Even if it's BPA-free, there's still plastic nastiness linking into your water, and you're using less plastic that the earth has to contend with, or the rest of us, if you will. The gut-brain axis, as I talked about, is a huge research arm right now. If you're taking better care of your gut, you're going to take better care of your brain. There is communication back and forth, as most scientists, myself included, uh, believe that that's the case. Eating fermented foods is a good idea. Maybe taking a probiotic is also a good idea. Just a little bit about sugar as we're getting uh, closing up on our show here. Rats, th this was a great study on rats, I've talked about it before. So they got rats addicted to cocaine. Got it? So now you've got ra uh, 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 rats that are addicted to cocaine. And then they gave the rats a choice, sugar or cocaine. They picked the sugar most of the time. So they could break the cocaine addiction of rats by giving them sugar. That's, that's how powerful sugar is. Pretty wild. So it's, it's very, very difficult. And that's why sugar is added to everything because it tastes really good and it gets us want, wanting this and not wanting that. Uh, 200 years ago, uh, the average person took about two pounds of added sugar per year. Some, um, now most people agree it's at least 60. Some say it's 150 or a half pound per day. A lot of that is soda and juices and sport drinks and so forth. Check out the book by Dr. Russell Blaylock called Excitotoxins, The Taste, Taste That Kills. It's all about MSG and the added uh, food additives. Truth and Labeling, Dr. ORG is that website I talked about earlier, so you can find that hidden in, in foods. And if you're cooking with oils at home, I suggest a oil change. An oil change. I think there should, there should only be three oils in your household. Avocado oil can be the one that you do high heat cooking with. You can also do that with the second one, coconut oil. And the last one, olive oil, should be used cold. So use olive oil on salads and adding things cold. Do not use high heat cooking uh, with olive oil. The other two is avocado oil and coconut oil, which can sustain heating. All other oils, throw them away. No vegetable oils and sunflower and safflower oils and soybean oil and so on and so forth. 
throw it away, it's all omega-6, it's really bad for your health, brain disease, and everything else. Lastly, I'm just going to review the changes again. So I just threw a bunch at you, but let's, br let's bring it back down again. Let's bring it back down to some simple things that you can try on your own and with your family and your kids. Only water, no soda, no diet soda, no juice, no fruit juice, no sport drinks. For many of you, that's enough to make the shift. Next is no snacks after dinner. Maybe, you, maybe that's the thing that you need to do. Okay. Rethinking breakfast, as I talked about, also for your kids. Maybe that's the one thing that you try, and that's going to help you out a lot. Dairy-free and or gluten-free. For some of you, if you're fighting a chronic problem of disease, you need to be doing that. 10% less volume of food, uh, of food that you're taking in, particularly dinner, by eating slower. 10% or more uh, of vegetables, great idea. 10% or more less meat, also a good idea. A 10% smaller uh, dinner and a larger lunch, as I had talked about. And then looking at your plate, making sure your plate is more vegetables, two-thirds vegetables, one-third meat or starch, as opposed to reverse, which was, was more meat and small veg amount of vegetables. And just to remember, because this is such a good thing, just try this on kids. You don't even have to tell them. Just kind of experiment and see what happens. Cut up a bunch of veg vegetables. Make them different. You know what your kids will like and not like. Make them different shapes and colors and sizes. Have different dips out there. And then if you want more information, you can go to my YouTube page where I've got a ton of videos. Continue watching the cable television show here. Go to my website, drscottfuller.com. And uh, I'm available to do, which I used to do, in-person in uh, consultations with groups and companies and so forth. Now I'm doing webinars and so forth. So check that out. Please join me again. Thank you. I'm going to go to the next one.